Good evening uh, and welcome to this evening's Lundy webinar. I'm Michael Williams and I'm Secretary of the Lundy Field Society. Uh, tonight I'm back in the Morisco Tavern uh, for, the, for tonight's session, which is going to be about the conservation breaks that the Lundy Field Society organises. I'm going to be joined by Trevor Dobie and B. Cox, uh, who will be here to talk about the working parties that have taken place over the years. Uh, and they're going to be sharing some of their experiences about when things might not have gone wholly as planned. The talk will last about half an hour and then we'll take questions at the end. If you're a regular viewer, then uh, it's a good time to fill your glasses uh, while I go through all of the usual housekeeping arrangements. If you're joining us for the first time, then you're very welcome. Uh, there are a few things that I need to run through before we start. Only the microphones and video cameras on Trevor's computer, B's computer and my computer are, are enabled, so you won't be able to see or hear. We won't be able to see or hear any of you watching at home. If you're on Zoom, then you're able to ask questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You just need to click the icon and then type your question into the box that pops up. If you're on a mobile or a tablet, uh, then you can find it on the menu bar and there's plenty of time for questions at the end. There's also a chat feature for comments and feedback, which we'll be monitoring during the talk. And if you're watching on YouTube, you're also very welcome, but there's no facility, I'm afraid, for asking questions. As ever, Dave Richards is behind the scenes hosting the Zoom session, and we'll make a recording available afterwards on YouTube. So uh, it's time for me to introduce our speakers. Uh, welcome to Trevor and B. Hello, B. Hello, hi. And hello, Trevor. Hello, Michael. How are you? Good. Good to have you here. So, uh, just a brief biographical introduction to our two speakers uh, before we get started. Trevor Doby has been visiting Lundy regularly since the 1990s, and he has a regular holiday there with his wife Karen every year. He first attended an LFS working party in 2003 before taking on the organization of the events in 2008. Uh, Trevor is a member of the LFS committee uh, and I can see that he and I are wearing uh, the same Lundy polo shirt this evening. <laughs> uh, B. Cox first discovered Lundy about 15 years ago and it has now become her happy place. Uh, she is the vice chair of the Lundy Field Society uh, and has attended several of the LFS working parties. B is also a Lundy ambassador, uh, and so she leads walks for visitors on the island, uh, and she also edits the Discovering Lundy Bulletin. 
Well, it's great to have you both here. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Trevor now for the first part uh, of this evening's talk. Over to you, Trevor. Thank you, Michael. And welcome, everybody, to this talk about working parties. Um, now, my screen button didn't want to work, so that's clever. A good start, isn't it? There we are. I've used the mouse. So, here we go. I'll tell you a bit about conservation while you're reading that about the history of the society. Uh, it started in 1946. Trevor, the... your, your screen hasn't shared yet. Oh dear. Hang on then. Oh, I can see it. Hang on a sec. Let's go back. Uh, okay. I haven't got a thing to share my screen. So you need, you need to make sure you're in your Zoom session. Okay. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah, I am now. Yeah, your pardon. Thanks. Sorry, everybody. Okay. Here we go. Sharing the screen. How's that? That's great. Yep. Okay. Back to you. There we are. Again, it was the, the LFS was started in 1946 by Professor Harvey and the owner of Lendy Martin Coles Harmon. And early working parties were mainly to do with um, studying and what have you. Uh, until 1984, the working parties weren't really going after the rhododendrons, but uh, it really was a problem noted very early and Martin Coles Harmon allowed the LFS to use the lower bit of the light, the old light tower there and also the little building on the right which is now staff accommodation old light west and this is what Martin Harmon thought about it at the time and you could tell if, when you've read that that it was a real problem with rhododendrons they were planted around 1860 and by 1950 they were a real problem. And when I say a real problem, the next slide will show you. In 1993, the whole east side of the island was covered in rhododendrons. And believe it or not, they'd already started pulling them out at this point. In the foreground of the picture, there were rhododendrons right round to the end of Milcom, but uh, they'd been cut back and they'd taken the stumps out and burnt them at the top of the, of the hill or where they are, or perhaps some landed in the in the bay. But this is what it looks like when it's cleared and in the distance you can see what it will look like if they don't do anything about it at this point. Here's a couple of photos of 2004 that I've sent this week. Thank you very much to the Gardner family. And there we see even in 2004 when they've been cutting at a fair time and this is one of my first working parties in this year. Um, you can see the extent of it. They look beautiful but you'll find out in a minute nothing grows underneath rhododendrons. So early working parties, there's Brummy Dave on the left-hand side looking chipper. And they've taken out the stumps on there, pulled out the stumps. You can see the craters behind right down to the, the granite stones and burning on in situ so there's no, no waste left over. And there's an early warden there, Andrew Gibson, and an early ranger, Rod Diamond. I don't know where he's cutting granite, but that's very early on again in the 1980s. So we move into the 2000s. There's Ruby Dave again. He's he's got his log for the for the fire, and Joyce Davis at the background. The late Joyce Davis, and you can see behind those two how dark and dingy and dank it is. And uh, there's Richard there going in with a with a handsaw. Again, you can you can look up through that that alleyway there. We're moving along in a in a line, cutting down the rhododendrons, dragging them out, and there's Kevin Williams down there throwing it on the fire on this occasion. But everything was cleared up, everything was done nicely, and at this point, stumps were touched up with a, with a herbicide that killed them off. We we're in the winding gear gully here, very tricky, nowhere to put a fire. Sophie, the assistant warden there, was throwing them off the cliff. Look away, Derek, we're burning it on the beach. Oh dear, never mind, it's, it's below the high tide mark, so that'll wash away in a, about a month. <clears throat> the fires kept going, cutting, huge great fires, some unlucky people managed to set fire to some peat. I don't think it was LFS, but the fires had to stop. So what do we do? We get a chipper in, a shredder in. Huge, great machine. No, no pictures of it, unfortunately, and it was only used a couple of times. You can see they have to build a platform. You have to get a helicopter to move the wretched thing. And it was not usable after the first couple of goes when you've done around it. You can't drag stuff all the way along the island. So we had to stack it. Stacked with rhododendrons. The warden at the time went off, changed over, the ranger changed over. Nobody had a certificate to say we could touch the 
the stumps. So believe it or not, some of those stacks are over the top of live stumps, live trees, in fact. And at the center of that picture, you can see it, these stacks changed to a greeny color, which was the autumn's bash on there with the, some of the National Trust volunteers and the working party from the LFS that cleared that section in two weeks in the autumn. So we got right through the rhododendrons and we came to the final stand of rhododendrons. We call it the last stand because it was the end of phase one of the rhododendron eradication. And we worked three or four days. This is our last working day on the island. Hope to get it all cleared, all stacked. Luckily, Nigel, the, the uh, shopkeeper, Nigel Dorby was there, took these series of photographs. And there we all are, leaning on the last standing rhododendron tree, at least ceremonially. The whole group there, including the wardens, the rangers, a previous ranger, second from the left is Rod Diamond again. And there, there we are, there's Steve cutting that last tree down. We all had a bit of a cheer. Turned around and went up to Felix Gates' hut and they'd set us up a nice little, little uh, celebration. Nigel found some scones that were still in date, a bit of cream, a bit of jam, a few bottles of bubbly. Very nice, very well. Thank you very much, everybody. Only problem is they forgot to bring any glasses. So all the bottles that we were using at that day for water bottles were cut, tops and bottom were cut off and we drank from those. Very good day was had by all. Fourth from the left, a man holding his glasses highest with a gray uh, Gillette on there. His name's Ray Bilton. He's an ex-jeweler. He's retired now and a clockmaker. And he took one of the bits of roadie that Steve cut off for him and turned it into a barometer for me and gave it to me on that kind. By the way, Ray, it doesn't keep very good time. Right, so we had to get rid of those stacks. Two or three years lying there, they'd started to rot down. Steve built a, uh, a platform there with a corrugated iron and scaffolding. Only one problem, the, the um, roadie bits that were burning were falling off the edge. You needed somebody around it all the time. So he built number two, Mark two, put fence all around, not fence, bit of guarding all around it. We can have a huge fire and get rid of everything. So. Very slowly, we moved along from, again, Quarry Beach in the background, moving south along the island, getting rid of these stacks of rhododendron, passing it one to the other, one to the other, dropping most of it. But the time we got to the end, we threw some on the fire. 14, 15 people in that line there. But Steve said it wasn't going quick enough. So we did some controlled stack burning. Did a few spot fires, see what was left. They burned very, very quickly because that stuff is tinder dry, left no mark at all. And we were lucky the following year, we had a couple of ex-firemen, retired firemen, the chap in the middle, I won't mention his name, but he's in the middle there. Then he comes from Mocop. And we got those hoses down. Steve got the fire tender. He got the bowser. Everything was ready. Hoses primed. And they sat and watched it burn like that. Derek, look away now. There we are. There's a nice little fire going. It burned for a couple of minutes like that, and it was gone. And after that, there was there's Nick Herbert there, the assistant. It's probably his first week of assistant, assistant ranger. And he's probably thinking, why didn't they do that before, before I got here? And Steve along there with the teapot and the hose at his feet. And it's all finished, all gone and done. So that got rid of most of the standing um, stacks of rhododendron. We've done some other jobs moving on from the rhododendrons. Is, is ladies Elaine Pugsley and Lillian and Dave Priest couldn't tell me her name, but they've got the horrible job of sheep dagging. If you don't know what that is, when the sheep get a bit hairy and woolly, they're, uh, they get a mess at the back and things like flies lay eggs in them and they get terrible problems from the maggots. So that's a job that has to be done. This is another Dave Priest photo, Brummy Dave. He said that these were tree stakes all sent down to Quarter War Cops. I don't think they are tree stakes, but he said they're probably still there because there weren't that many trees planted down there. We've done lots of dry stone walling, several a sequence of pictures coming up here with the top left hand side. They all look like they just pushed that over, don't they, to give themselves something to do. But that wall had fallen over and they were given the task. Bottom picture, they're taking it right down to the, to the base to get a decent base and then they start building it up. And another sequence here, different wall, but you see the end. Uh, this left hand picture in the distance on the right hand side there is the lambing shed so you can see where that is if anybody you know Lundy uh, and this particular one they put a fence posts in the top and the idea being that they could put a line down it and stop the sheep from scrambling over the top which they do believe it or not sheep scramble over those walls 
is a very early one. This is this is probably Dave could be this picture, and it shows an early one with him in the middle with a bobble hat. Tony Cutler on the left hand side, a stalwart of working parties, and uh, particularly Emma Parks there, who I didn't meet, but she was a previous warden on Lundy, helping out with the dry stone wall. We've done tree planting and a lot of maintaining. This is a previous warden, Nicola Saunders. People might remember her. She was there for several years. And three or four years she's been there at this point. And she looked at me and said, Do you know, this is the first tree I planted. So I had to take that photograph. And this is a nursery that's in the stacks of rhododendrons. It's still there um, along the Lower East Side path. Again, we built this nursery. It's a round affair with sticks in the ground and built it up with, with rhododendron brush at the end and make it into a nursery. And there we are a few years later inside it. It's done its job. Those trees are now ready to be planted. Dug out as we were here, taken up to the top of the hill behind uh, quarter wall cops and hopefully to extend it up the hill. And there we are. And I can tell you what year that is by the clothing. That was February 2018. More on that story later. So we went down, planted those trees, go down and get another lot, come and do some more. We planted many, many that week, believe, believe it or not, and it was absolutely bitter. When the trees are in and they need a bit of maintaining, especially around in Milcombe, cut some carpet, put a slice through it, hole in the middle, goes nicely around the base of those trees, hold it down with a bit of metal or a spike, or in this case, stones, and it stops all the weeds coming up afterwards. We've done steps, again, lots of steps, you know, Lundy, the Lower East Side path, you get to Sugarloaf. There was a horrible bit there. You had to scramble up or scramble down. Uh, it always annoyed me when I got there. So this is my brother Keith digging a, took him 20 minutes to dig that hole. Put a spade down. It's quite soft material. It's not clay, but it's that kind of stuff. And we, we put a step in there and hopefully it's still there. These were done on, when I was there, but this is a working party. Put these steps in on a particular slippery slope down past the then the gas shed between Government House and Milcombe House. You'd see how muddy it was that week as well with the, with the state of the soil. Now this is one of my idea, but I didn't get to do it, but that bottom step, you drag yourself up from the jetty, you get right to the stop, top before you're going to go in the tavern, and that bottom step that you see on that picture, I've had to lighten it a bit, unfortunately, but the bottom step was a stone that rocked about an ankle breaker, wherever there was one. So Glyn there, the Glyn Davis, who's a builder, he came over with us and he, he was in charge of putting that stone in it. It's a damn good job, it's still there now. We've cleared out ponds. This is Milk and Pond, beginning picture on the left. There is a pond there, believe it or not, it's covered in those, in those reeds and what have you. And there's Andy Bell there. He's always wanted to be a submarine captain, so we let him go down there. And there's your girls there clearing it. That's Ali and Anna. There they are up to their elbows in it. And uh, can you see Ruth there at the back? She's got her, um, her camouflage gear on, but they've taken all the reeds out. And there's Mandy D there up to her elbows in to the, to the sediment. And there's the finished article on the right hand side. All the, it's all gone. I think it's probably covered over again with reeds now, but it needs doing regularly and probably a JCB in there. But there's a nice little find. They found an eel, called it Neil the Eel. So there it is, Neil the Eel. Apparently one was found there some years ago as well in Milk and Pond and they have to climb all up from the sea. Well, how do they do that? I don't know. This is last year, the pond at Brumble Villas. It was overgrown, not working, useless. And I can tell you I went on holiday a week after this was done in end of October last year. Very wet week, floods everywhere, included on Lundy and that pond filled up nicely. We've done fencing. This again is around Milk and Pond. Fence has been repaired, posts going in. The right hand side finished job thanks for those pictures beginning and end it really shows off what we do and again here down in Barton Field there's the church with scaffolding on behind so it's only a year or two ago knocking a stake like a boat like a start hole put a post in and then you ask for Lofty because he can lift that that big basher lift it up bunk them in hopefully they're straight and then put the wire up behind good job this is another tree nursery behind, you can see if you don't, if you know Lundy, that's Milcombe House. So this is the Milcombe Valley. And this is done uh, several years ago, probably um, 2015, 16. And those trees that are in there now are, are a good size and they look really good. And on the other side of the valley is one we did many years before, needs a bit of TLC. So they've got extra wood, bits of slots on there, probably rendered the gate and uh, keep the deer and the goats out. And those trees in there will be tended and come on nicely. 
Corder War Gate. Sorry, not Corder War. What we're talking about? East Side Path, long from Melcombe. That gate post had collapsed, had rotted at ground level. We dug it out. Steve said, put at least 18 inches in. But he didn't tell me that about nine inches in, it was solid granite. So we couldn't get any deeper than nine or 10 inches. Put the gate post up. I don't know the grey head fella is, but it's in. It was there again last time I went, so it's looking good. And again, a couple of years ago, maintenance. I think it might well be Dean's house. Hello, Dean. How are you? Um, the wall is it shows behind it. All that bramble and all that stuff on his roof has been cut away. And a bit of weeding in front of his door there. This is another path, another ankle breaker position just below the ugly on the Lower East Side path. That path was virtually disappeared. So we put some shuttering along, some stakes to hold it up, fill it up with some material. Lovely job, well done. Now, if you go down from the top of the top of the um, Milcom Valley, you go down and see if you go to the ugly. There's a gate on your left hand side just before the ugly. And it used to be through the gate and down a slippery slope. But in this particular year, this Tim, sorry, Tim, I've got no better picture of you than the back of your head. He was helping us there, putting that fence all the way up there. And it is a long stretch. And a few years later, the Sea Scouts, I believe, put some steps in. But by 2016, they were in need of repair. And this working party in October 2016 took all the old steps out on the left hand side in the middle. They tidied up all the vegetation and then started to install them on the right hand side. And the finished article, bottom looking up, top looking down. I think that might be Ken Williams by the outline, taking that photo, leaving that silhouette. But a lovely job. And everybody was really, really proud of themselves that week. And there they all are, apart from probably Dave, who's skiving off somewhere as usual. And there's on the left hand side there, that's Gabby Humphreys, leader that week. She was really proud of all the work they did that week. And Fred and James Staff, father and son, who was there that there also. And everybody turned up for a pint in the beer garden, including Brummy Dave. Look at that. We've done gully clearing. Several places. This one is between Quarry Pond and the Bellevue Cottages. So that gully runs right down from the pond up by the quarter wall gate. Gully runs down, goes to, disappears over the top, probably, I surmise, for to feed the uh, steam pump for the winding gear. So there's people out with their all their wet weather gear, cold weather gear. And on their knees, tidying that all up. And there's on the right hand side is the finished article, water trickling down, good as new. This this particular gully, another nasty piece. If you walk up on the main track, get to Quarter Wall Gate and it's mud, it's ponds, it's under the gate is wet. Believe it or not, if you dig that gully out where there's Dave Stone digging that gully out there and get the pipe underneath the gate clean, that all drains away and it's all kept nice and dry. Alexander deheading, we've done several goes of that. This isn't a Lundy picture, I couldn't find one, but that's what it looks like. And it's a real pest. Ask Andrew Cleave, he'll tell you that it will be a real pest in several years' time. This is from 95. Believe it or not, there's a sheep roundup. These aren't all LFS members, I don't think, but there was an LFS party there at the time who joined in. Chap in the middle, again, Tony Cutler with his trademark green anorak. Uh, and the idea was that they went right to North End and drove those sheep down to catch them in the nets. Or the sheep. And the chap at the front there, he's got his, he's off somewhere. And um, apparently Dave Fries says a third of them were left on the island. A third of them were a bit scraggly and scrawny, were fed through the tavern menu. And a third of them were taken off to Scotland. And he thought it was St Kilda, but whether he was mixed up or not, I don't know. But send me an email if you know what happened to those all those sheep, because they were all rounded up there. This is one of B's favourite jobs, painting the H, whitewashing it and the helicopter pad. This, she took this when they were taken off. And also we've had members that have been asked to paint the stones on the airfield, which is... Bit of a long job. We've done jobs in the farmyard, especially when it's been wet, cold, horrible, not very nice weather. There's Bob Bugatti, bottom left there, cutting up an old, um, some old wood and old bits and pieces. And on the right hand side, they're being chopped up for kindling and they're sold for a nice little profit in the shop. Top left there, there's, uh, is, is Kelly holding down that bit of piping. It's obviously flying all over the place till they can get it tied. And there's Keith and my nephew Kieran, that's my brother Keith, nephew Kieran, sanding the benches that we brought in for the winter. That was in uh, October 2008, obviously. The, uh, so that was another stormy week. And they were cleaned up nicely, 
sand it down, put oil on and back it again next year. Another important job we helped with on their days off, believe it or not, this is Shearwater Nest Boxes, all the materials on the left hand side of the tractor shed there, a few people from the, I think the RSPB. So Dave, getting in on the act, he's doing some work there, look, putting together these nest boxes. And on the right hand side, you can see the, the actual nest box itself with the hole. And there's what they look like when they're in underground. You, you can't see them obviously underground, but the, the, the wood bit is the nest box and the tube is there that pretended to be a rabbit hole. Tony Taylor there, finding a way of putting it in. Kick it is the best way, obviously. And um, put the pipe on afterwards. And left hand was well, the only picture I've got of you, Becky. Sorry, side of your face. But Tony's checking it works and seeing if it makes sure that we can see the, the nest inside. And on the right hand side, he's uh, watching Brummy Dave, checking for the Lundy Bunny. Good old Dave. Heligoland traps. We've had a lot of fun with Heligoland traps. This particular one was a quarter war, quarter war trap it was called. Horses rubbed against it, ponies rubbed against it. Uh, so we put a fence around and uh, helped all the posts. Two years later, it came down. That was a particularly wet day. We were absolutely drenched. This is the one on the terrace, what they were hoping to use. They won't use it because there's no vegetation in and the birds won't go in. We're not allowed to plant anything. It's a scheduled monument. So we put the fence across it, stop the, the feral goats and sheep going in. Lovely job. It worked for a while. Last year, we went in May. We were asked to get rid of the wire that's on the side until it can be completely repaired because it's flopping about. So we took all the wire down, all the like, chicken wire, and put a proper sheep-proof fence all along that side where you can see those people working. The mistake we made, and I'll blame Nick, he used the quad and its winch to tighten up the fence onto the corner post. Three months later, it was in a heap, and I believe it's still like that. And there's a decision being made of whether it comes down or it's repaired. But again, tricky because it's it's monumental ground. We've got a fruit cage and milk and water gardens. If you walk up the main track now, you have a bit of a stop for a breather and look over the garden, you'll see that fruit cage still looking good, start to finish. And in the same week, we replaced a wall in Milcombe Gardens just above that. The wall in the middle of the picture there, go left to right tumble down, took it all out completely, stacked all the, all the stones, cut off that thing behind, which is, I don't know what that's called, elephant grass. And then we, Steve decided that the best man to do it, anybody had any building experience, this chap, Dave Stern, I'm a plumber, retired plumber, right, you'll do, you're in charge of bricklaying. So there he is down on his hands and knees and helping out. There's our current chairman in the gray, Alan Rowland, who was there on that week checking it's all working nicely. And there we are, a lovely job, finished off there with the steps in the middle. Right, that concludes my report. So now it's over to B. Thank you. Right, let's just get my screen shared. Right, thank you, Trevor. Um, so now Trevor's told us a bit about the working parties through the ages. I'm going to talk a bit more about what's happened in recent times. So first of all, I, I have attempted to credit photos I've used where possible, but I'm not sure where some of them came from. So if you see one of your photos and it hasn't been credited, please let me know for the future. Now, I know that some of you um, watching have been on a working party um, and you'll agree with me I'm sure that they can be brilliant fun with amazing teamwork and great friendships that can blossom. If you haven't been on one I'll just tell you a little bit about them now. So we do three a year and up to 14 of us stay in the barn usually for seven or eight days. The barn's a really cozy comfy space um, for a group and it's got dormitory sleeping arrangements which work very well, um, but earplugs do come highly recommended. The barn is right next to the shop, so really convenient. And importantly, it's only about a minute walk from the tavern, but we are there to work. The schedule for the week is arranged by the conservation team on the island and our working day starts at about half past eight and goes on till about five o'clock. We have plenty of breaks during the day to enjoy the views, chat with your teammates, or sometimes just to sit and contemplate the world around you. 
Now, as you've seen, the working parties take on a variety of tasks, but at the moment, one of our most important jobs is undertaking rhododendron seedling searches as part of the roadie eradication project that Trevor's already told us about. So in formation, we walk backwards and forwards across the island and we mark any seedlings we find with bamboo canes. We've got the ranger following us behind and he then snips them off near the ground and treats the stem with herbicide. So just to illustrate how important that is to the eradication project of which the LFS has been a major part. When we searched two years ago, we were finding more than 2000 seedlings in some of the areas. At the beginning of last year, on when I was on a working party, we searched two areas. On one of them, we managed to find one roadie hiding under a rock. And the other one, we were delighted to confirm that it was clear of rhododendrons. And it is likely that that project will need to continue for at least another four years. Meals are a very, very important part of the working party experience. We take it in turns to cook the evening meal, usually in pairs, and the chefs choose their own menu. And you can be as inventive as you like, and all dietary requirements can be catered for. We get one day off during the week, and you can do whatever you'd like to then. Many people go for a walk, often up to the north end. Some follow the clues to find the Lundy letterboxes. And depending who's in the working party or on the island, or some people just like to go swimming or just have a bit of chillax time. Um, on our day off, we eat in the tavern, so there's no pressure on anybody to cook. Now, obviously, the working parties are well planned. But sometimes, as in general life, things don't always go to plan. And um, part of the Lundy experience is the weather, which can be quite unpredictable. So I'm just going to share a few stories from working parties over the last few years. As you've seen, the work we do on working parties can be quite physical. And we're often in tricky parts of the island, especially when we're on the east side slopes. And accidents can happen, although thankfully so far that we've had fairly minor, one, minor ones. So in 2015, the stalwart of working parties, Brummy Dave, who's Trevor's already introduced us to, slipped on the slope and cut his arm quite badly. But Brummy Dave being Brummy Dave, he didn't tell anyone. It was noticed later that day, and as any accident should be, it was reported to one of the island's first aiders. A decision was made to medivac him off the island, so the Ilfracoom lifeboat crew came over to take him off and they mended him at Barnstable Hospital, so all was good. But at a working party he attended the next year, he did a charity head, beard and eyebrow shave for the RNLI, raising just under £400. So that was really good. Now back to the weather. A storm Ophelia hit the island in 2017. This was a big storm um, with the highest wind speeds ever recorded in Ireland. Luckily, Lundy only experienced the edge of the storm, but the wind did have quite an effect. Just before Ophelia hit, Farmer Kevin had decided to cut the grass in the fields behind the church for hay. And unfortunately, his baler had broken, so he was unable to collect the loose grass. So this happened. Now, I wasn't on the island at the time, so I'm just going to read part of the working party report from that, um, that time by Bob Bugatti, which was published in the LFS Discovering Lundy Bulletin. Monday, the 16th of October was the 30th anniversary of the great storm of 1987 that ravaged the country. And to celebrate this, we were to experience Hurricane Ophelia. Luckily, the storm had somewhat abated crossing the Atlantic, but at its peak, we were still to experience gusts of force 10 winds on the island. That morning, we resumed our places at the previous work sites. Luckily, it was relatively sheltered in Milcombe Valley, but it was evident that the wind speed was increasing. So we relocated to the farmyard for either recycling, painting or kindling making duties. This had the advantage of being only a short walk back to the barn at the end of the working day, but the disadvantage that it was a real struggle to fight your way the 50 yards or so in the wind tunnel 
caused by the storm up the side of the barn and that is actually called Windy Alley and for a good reason. Tuesday morning saw the results of Ophelia. Due to the havoc caused by the storm, hay from the helicopter field had been blown over the whole village, as you've seen from the photos. We helped to salvage as much of the hay as possible. There were many one-liners banded about hay, but it was, hey ho, hey ho, it's off to work we go. And we started to rake up in front of the shop tavern etc then around quarters. Kevin the farmer then proceeded to bale up the hay with his then repaired baler and I lost count of how many bales he made with our efforts. In recognition he promised us some soe lamb and duly delivered it to us that evening in the barn. The next adventure was in February 2018 when Storm Emma came through. Emma brought heavy snowfalls of up to 57 centimetres in the UK and saw temperatures falling as low as minus 11. Of course, the worst affected areas were southwest England and southern Wales. Now, I was on the island for this one and it was quite an experience, I can tell you. It also delayed us leaving the island by three days. There was a lot of damage to the properties, to the beach road and to the landing bay and frozen pipes meant um, problems with water supply. Some of the toilets were out of action and there were floods in several of the properties. Luckily, the supply in the barn wasn't affected, but we didn't get off scot-free. We had snow falling through gaps in the skylight and the downstairs dorm, and we had to move one of the beds to stop it getting soaked. Now, there are two back doors in the barn, but they didn't do their jobs as doors on this occasion. When we woke up in the morning, we had there were snow drifts inside both of them. And we even had a visit in the downstairs dorm from a little snowy owl. Obviously, the staff, the islanders, were really busy trying to make properties safe. So we did anything we could to help them. Um, some of the properties have stoves, usually burning furnaceite, but due to the really low temperatures and people wanting to burn the furnaceite, they ran out. So we helped by chopping wood and kindling, which kept us warm doing the job. And of course, did mean that we could make sure we had enough wood for the barn, uh, the fire in the barn. And I'm also delighted to report that since then, the skylight and the doors have all been fixed and now work very well. The most recent episode was Castaway in April 2019, which reached local and national news. We were due to leave the island on Saturday and MS Oldenburg arrived in fairly strong easterly winds. The plan being to do what is fondly known as a splash and dash. Now that's when only staying visitors travel across, so no day visitors. Supplies are quickly unloaded and the boat leaves as soon as the leaving visitors are aboard. However, on this occasion, while attempting to moor to the jetty, um, with the rough sea and wind, both propellers were fouled by her lines, leaving the Oldenburg stranded with no power. This meant the crew and the arriving passengers had to remain on the boat um, moored to the jetty until the tide had dropped and the sea had settled. It also meant that the visitors due to leave, including the working party, would be unable to. So there were double the guests on the island to be housed, fed and watered. Now the islanders were absolutely amazing. The arriving visitors took over their book properties, but for those of us stranded and unable to leave, the staff set up mattresses in the church. Some people camped out in the wheelhouse, which is the room at the back of the pub, and people who needed proper beds for medical reasons were put up in spare beds in properties. And in some cases, the islanders even gave up their own beds. Those who didn't have homes where they could do their own cooking, like us, were given food and drink in the tavern um, on the Lundy Company tab, but we did have to buy our own beer. The Oldenburg crew, of course, were still on the boat, which remained stranded on the jetty. Two lifeboats came over from Ilfracombe and Appledore to keep a watch over her while she waited for commercial tug Afon Allor to arrive from Pembrokeshire. 
Uh, the tug arrived just after midnight and towed the oldie to Ilfracombe, arriving shortly after sunrise, where the ropes were removed from her props. She was checked over and given a clean bill of health. So this took us to Sunday, where we now had free time and the crew were able to get some sleep. Some went out for walks and some of us spent time adding bits to the banners for the church, which were being embroidered at the time. And this one was on the island. And obviously we did anything we could to help the staff. So on Sunday afternoon, there were two couples um, medivac medivaced from the island and along with two of the working party. Jeff is an eye surgeon who had an operating list on the Monday and was very grateful to be able to leave with his father, who was his chauffeur. And I'm sure his patients were grateful that he was able to do his operating list as well. We did keep his suturing skills in practice over the weekend though, by giving him the eye of the gull to embroider on the banner. And we were collected on the Monday afternoon. Thankfully, the journey back to the mainland was uneventful, but I honestly cannot praise the staff and crew enough for their hard work over that weekend, keeping everyone safe and comfortable. So just to close, while we do work hard, very hard sometimes on the working parties and they can pose challenges. We do have great fun, great excitement, meet some lovely new people and can make lasting friendships. If you'd like to join a working party, that's lasting friendships. If you'd like to join a working party, please take a look at the LFS website. All the details are on there. Um, if you click on what we do and then conservation work, everything you need to know is there. And there's the Lundy um, web address for you. Thank you very much. And back to Michael. Thank you very much, B, uh, and Trevor as well. It's been fantastic. Uh, great insight into uh, all of the amazing work that goes on on these conservation breaks. I, I never quite know whether to call them conservation breaks or working holidays, but I suppose that the term is interchangeable, isn't it? Um, okay, well, we've had to, we've already had some some questions in, um, so we're going to turn uh, straight to those. Um, first one is from Clive Smith. Uh, Clive has uh, had a reputation early on in these talks of uh, getting the first question in, so uh, he's managed it again this week. Uh, Clive says, firstly, thank you to all of you for a lot of hard work, uh, and as someone who has visited Lundy once or twice a year for the last 15 years, your achievements are very noticeable and add a lot to my enjoyment of Lundy. So thanks for those words, Clive. His question is, is how do you determine the priorities for the working parties? And are there any jobs uh, you do linked to the particular skills of the people on the working party? Trevor. Yes, well, the jobs are allocated um, by the ranger at the moment. I'm not sure whether there's a ranger on Lundy at the moment, but it was Nick Herbert. And he will send me a list about a week or so before of the schedule for the week. And he's got all the jobs listed in there. So, um, you know, if you say road is one day, doing a search, doing this, and he's got jobs lined up ready for us. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Um, are any of the jobs linked to people's particular skills? Well, occasionally, yes. Um, we had a chap a few years ago who was a Land Rover um, mechanic and one of the Land Rovers broken and he helped in the mechanic in the, in the workshop for a day. So, yes, that does happen. And we had to say we had a couple of ex-firemen helping us with the fire. So yes, that does happen. Great, thank you. Um, just a, while, while I remember, uh, a reminder to everybody at home to um, put your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Just click, click the button, type the question into the box. Uh, the next question I think is, is one for B. Uh, it's John Tyra says, brilliant presentation and photos. Uh, his, his question is, is, are you ever tempted to misspell the H? <laughs> I've, I've been tempted to put ELP after it. <laughs> 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 but uh, it's actually concreted in, so you, you are just painting concrete, you're not painting it on the grass. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jenny Davis, uh, says uh, physical limitations preclude active involvement. Are there any other uses for a willing but creaking participant? 
Trevor. Yeah, that's difficult, but um, we do try to include people with any disabilities, but working on those slopes at 45 degrees, you need, you need to be really steady. And I would suggest the best course of action for this lady is to go and speak to Dean, send him an email, I'll give you his address if you like, and they will, if they can, as you know, Michael, they will help people of disability as best they can. But on a working party, although we'd love to include people, but you know, you just can't, you're marching off half a mile away, a mile away and working on the slopes, or even in the looking for roadie seedlings, it can be very difficult for anybody that isn't potentially quite fit to get through. So the warden is your best bet there, I think. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Trevor. So uh, just to add, to add to that, Jenny, um, the island takes a, a lot of volunteers throughout the year, not just through uh, working parties. So um, your best bet is to drop the island the line and uh, look out for volunteer opportunities directly on the island. So thanks for that. Um, um, bum, bum, bum. Let's just read some of the comments that have come in. Um, uh, Sue and Jim Maguire from Western Supermare say, enjoying tonight's presentation. Time to confess, um, but we hope it won't lead to our arrest. Quite a few years ago, we thought the run a, a Lundy roadie seedling would make a great souvenir. It survived and is still growing and blossoming in a big pot in our patio. <laughs> we'll send the boys. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have read that one out. <laughs> Um, Joe Grau-Bray says, my mum has been visiting Lundy annually for at least 30 years. We love the island and love the roadies. And I certainly remember some of my early visits to Lundy. If you were there in sort of uh, spring, early summer, the whole of the east side of the island would go this amazing pink colour, the same as uh, the pink that's behind Trevor at the moment. Uh, and sometimes you'd arrive on the island in, at that time of year and it, would, it was almost like you were arriving in somewhere tropical. There was so much colour. But it's all gone now. Um, question from Claire Mitchell here, uh, perhaps one for you, B. Um, uh, she says, fabulous. And she had a chat with B in the barn once about going on a working party, and she's more keen than ever now. Good to hear it. Um, <laughs> just a query, how do you keep the island looking natural uh, when it has to be so well managed to conserve it? And how is that balance, dis balance established? I think probably the ranger would be the uh, the person to talk to about that. I mean, as Trevor said, we just we just do the jobs we're given. Um, I don't know if Trevor wants to comment on that. It's you know we, it's not up to us to do that really. It's it's up to um, the conservation team on the island um, to decide what they want doing, um, and they do that in they talk to a lot of people about it. Uh, there's a lot of um, protection for the island. So there are some things that, that we're actually not allowed to do. Um, and I, I, can, I can also add here that, uh, of course, there's the Lundy Management Forum, which uh, is there for, to manage the whole, of, the whole of Lundy. And it's a consultative, collaborative group with lots of national bodies involved. Uh, and, and it produced a conservation plan for the island a few years ago. So, so a lot of the uh, strategic approach, which I suppose, of the conservation work that's going on on, on Lundy is guided by the uh, conservation plan. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question, Claire. Uh, Brian Woodcock. So hello, Brian. He says, thank you for a super talk. Uh, and it's especially good to hear all about Lundy as we would have been on Lundy as we speak. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's from Brian and Lita Woodcock. Good to hear from you. Um, uh, Leslie Armstrong asks, uh, we've done a few National Trust working holidays. Are the LFS ones more suited to singles or couples? And how much do they cost? Trevor. Okay, um, they're not suited to sing they're suited to either, basically. We've got a working party coming in October. Derek, please. And we have some couples coming, so that you don't get a double room, unfortunately. You saw the um, the bed arrangements. It's hopefully, there's a, a right amount of ladies and the right amount of men, but that doesn't always work, so we have to mix and match. But we do take couples. Uh, we don't have arguments with couples. We don't allow that, but we have couples. And 
Um, yes, we'll accept anybody, singles, couples, anybody can apply. It's, you can apply on the website. Unfortunately, I'll t tell you about next year if you want to, but because we've had to cancel the, the March and the May working party for this year because of some disease that people are talking about. I haven't heard much about it. Um, we've offered those people first dibs for next year and both the May, sorry, the, Mar the March, April and May working parties are full. So the next one coming up is in October and at the moment that's full. Nobody's told me they're not coming. They're ill and cats not ill well or anything like that, but I'm assuming that some people will possibly not go. So watch the website and if spaces come up, we'll advertise them. Anybody can come. As long as you're fit. And Thanks able, Trevor. Uh, and the, the other part of Leslie's question was about how much do they cost? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, well, if you're a member of the Field Society, uh, which is £25 a year for single membership, Michael will tell you about that later, you come for nothing. You come for nothing. You pay a deposit, and as long as you turn up, that deposit goes to the leader, and it will go towards your food bill, which you do need to pay at the end of the week. It's about £40, £50 for the food bill, depending on Sue, of course. Hello, Sue. Depending on how kind she is in the shop. But it's £40, £50 per person. You get yourself to the port. You come over to Lundy, you pay for your food, and you go home. The only thing is, if you're not a member, you have to, we ask you for a donation to cover all our costs of £50. So it's easier to be and cheaper to join the LFS and apply to come on a working party. Thanks, Trevor. B, do you want to add to that? Yeah, as well as the food, you have to pay for your own drink as well. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Uh, and also you get free free passage on the ship yeah. Uh, yeah. because the yeah. Lundy Field Society pays for your for your boat tickets. So, uh, so uh, there's, there's no cost to pay to get to Lundy either. So great value, I think. Do you agree? <laughs> We're yes. giving it away. We're giving it away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got a couple of questions about, about age. So um, Peter Long and uh, Ellen Garrard, uh, both got questions. So Ellen's on the waiting list for a for a conservation trip. Uh, she asks, uh, what generally is the age range of the volunteers? Uh, and Peter Long is also asking, uh, what's the minimum age at which somebody can join a working party when accompanied by an adult? Uh, his sixteen year old daughter is keen. Yeah, Do you want to take we, that one, Trevor. Yeah, we did. Uh, since I've been going, we had one sixteen year old girl that that came over. Um, but we felt that it was just too risky for sleeping in those arrangements and it was just too much of a problem. So we don't take anybody, unfortunately, under the age of 18, so they have to be an adult. Uh, sorry, okay, I was just concentrating on that bit. And what was the other bit? Uh, it's about the age range. What's the typical oh, yeah, age uh, range of participants? Okay. Uh, well, it tends to be retired people, I, I would think, but we do get a decent age range. We've had students when it's been um, in a set, when we used to have September, when we had students that would come over, there would be um, biology students. But I'd say mostly they're retired people or people with some holiday. And I do appreciate people that if they are reserves, I, you know, if they want to come and we're full up, I say, can we have a reserve? Are you available to come at a short notice? Because somebody will drop out definitely and then you could come. So people that haven't got any ties are fantastic. But I'd say the majority are, are uh, retired people. Um, I can see I can see B was shaking her head. I don't um, think she agrees with you. <laughs> she's retired. <laughs> there's a there's a massive age range. I mean, yes, we get a few students, but I would say the majority of people are between 30 and 60. I know some of you are older than that, Trevor. But <laughs> you're, you're thinking of Brummy Dave. He puts the average up too high. No, no, I'm, I'm not. We get, we get a massive age range. <laughs> I'm going to move us quickly on. I hope that answers. Uh, I hope that answers the questions. Um, uh, Ian Campbell says thanks for a great presentation. Let's hope we can get some more LFS members. Thanks for that, Ian. Uh, David Can says well done with the rhododendron removal. Uh, and that leads me nicely on to a question from Paul Connolly, uh, and I'll mention Paul's name again later on. Paul's uh, leading our, our uh, webinar next week. So Paul says, thank you both for your lovely presentation. Uh, I've always had a sneaking admiration for the roadies uh, and remember wonderful times on the island when we all walked through the beautiful purple canopy. 
What's the worst that could happen if the roadies were allowed to return? Trevor. Oh, 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 B, B, do you want to go first, oh, B? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the reason for the eradication project is to um, is for the Lundy cabbage. Um, so the worst that could happen is that the Lundy cabbage will go, we, will become extinct. Um, uh, if you if you don't know about this, the Lundy cabbage is is a plant which is a cabbage plant that only grows on the east side of Lundy, um, and because the east side was being taken over by the roadies, the numbers of the cabbages were declining. Um, and certainly we, there are, uh, um, well, Alan and Sandra Rowland um, do Lundy count or counts every year of the Lundy cabbages. And um, the numbers are now going up since the roadies are being eradicated. So um, it's a good job because otherwise we lose the cabbage which is a very rare plant endemic to Lundy. And also we lose um, a beetle that lives on the cabbage and a, a weevil as well. So three species would be extinct, whereas rhododendrons grow all over the place really, don't they? Yeah, I'm, I'm just um, uh, picking up some comments here in the chat, which is also about rhododendrons. Uh, Gary Bridge says, really enjoyed that many thanks. Good to see the roadie as it was. I spent half a dozen or so weeks over the years with the National Trust tackling it and remember well how horrendous it was. Um, so that's great to hear. Uh, we also remember having a small peat fire, uh, but they did have enough fire buckets on standby. <laughs> um, Helen Clark Hayton says, thank you all for a fun and informative presentation. Look forward to joining one of the working parties. Brilliant. Uh, she's only been to Lundy once on a very misty, wet day, but thoroughly enjoyed herself uh, and looks forward to returning. That's Helen from Pilton in Barnstable, so she's not far away from Lundy. Uh, Gary Bridge, uh, going back to the the national the uh, LFS conservation breaks and the fact that your costs are covered, uh, he comments, it's a heck of a lot cheaper than the National Trust. <laughs> That's certainly true, Gary. <laughs> um, so let's stay with the theme about, about uh, attending. So Joanne Welby says, another great talk to add to a magnificent series so far. I suspect that once bookings uh, open for working parties, the places will go almost immediately. Uh, how much notice is given? Uh, what, for what? For the working party? Well, well yeah, we, so book, we, we book one year in advance. So if one comes up, it, it comes up in April next year, it already came up exactly a year in advance. But as I say, because we had to cancel the two working parties for this spring, those people, uh, and the majority of them voted to either have their, have their uh, deposit back or come again next year. And or I think out of 14, I think 13 said, yes, we're coming. And, and in fact, it, what, that was the case because Mandy was, D was going to come and she's already booked to go to Lundy. So B, you're coming instead, aren't you, is to be the leader. Yeah. So Thank you. It's yeah, a, year, yeah, a, year, a year in advance is, is, the, is the answer. It, keep on the website, look at it. It's April, um, May at the moment, and then October. So if you look a year in advance, you get in, not next year because that's difficult already, but you can get in, you send it in, it's first come, first served. And I love a mixture of five or six people who have been before, know what's going to happen, and the rest, all new people. We get new people that have never been to Lundy before, coming on a working party, and fall in love with it. In fact, the ranger, the assistant ranger of a couple of years ago, a little girl, I can't think of her name, never been to Lundy before, came with us, I believe, on the Beast of the East, wasn't it, V? No, and it was one. it was the one where we were delayed for four days getting on. That was the fog one the year before, the yeah. The fog one, yeah. Uh, yeah, and she stayed. She loved it. So in the three or four days we were there, Friday to Monday, we didn't get we didn't get there to the Friday on the helicopter. And she became the assistant warden. She just fell in love with the place. And that's what happens to people. They come, as you know, they come to London. They fall in love with it. They want to keep coming back. It's the same with everybody. Working parties, visiting, everything. Thanks very much, Trevor. I'm uh, just going to take the last question or so now. So last opportunity to put your question in. Um, we, Leslie McLean uh, has, uh, says that uh, 
I miss the rhododendrons, appreciate the Lundy cabbage preservation, but could they not have left some rhododendrons up near Brazen Ward? It's a very yeah, invasive plant, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> we, we've had this story before, but if you leave one rhododendron flowering now, apparently it's been worked out there's thousands of seeds, which is why we've got all the seedlings on the top of the, that we're still searching for. They're still there, it, down in the long grass. And if you leave them, one flower seeds, thousands of little seedlings and you're back to square one again. Keeps us in work, but I don't think there's a good use of our, our manpower. Do we know how long it will be until Lundy can be declared rhododendron free? Um, well, um, Nick was saying last year that it was probably going to be 2025. But of course, I don't know what effect not having the working parties doing the seedling searches this year will will have on it so it's going to be at least another four years i would say yeah so so the absence of working parties monitoring them as may put back the program because yeah. you, you're not keeping a track of them yeah mm -hmm. good point okay well there's a few more just a few more comments uh oh there's another question from claire mitchell uh, is there a maximum number of volunteers uh, and if you book and pay for your own property can you still help if it coincides with the working party uh, that has happened, uh, believe it or not, a lady did, wanted to come on a working party, didn't fancy the barn and she booked her own accommodation. Um, but we, the trouble is the more than 14, it becomes a bit of an unruly bunch for the, for the ranger to handle. But um, I'm certain that if you spoke to the, the best way, if you, if you don't want to come or you can't get on a working party is to speak to D Dean. He is, was crying out for volunteers to help out with the puffin surveys and things. People to go for a couple of weeks, students, whatever, in, you know, and they're always after volunteers, people to go over, stay in the, what do they call that little place in the farmyard? And um, it's ideal. Speak to Dean. Yeah, the lodge, I think you mean. Yeah. The lodge, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Richard Breeze has uh, written in, he says, uh, uh, great talk. Can we have a cheer on the occasion of the announcement of the island's reopening on July the 4th? Yeah! <laughs> you announce it, we'll cheer. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So we heard, we heard the news this afternoon, if you haven't picked it up already, that uh, uh, Lundy's reopening on the 4th of July. So uh, the first businesses will uh, be able to go over and stay uh, in, what is it, just a uh, week on Saturday. Not far away now. So we look forward to that. I think we're all looking forward to getting back to back to the island. Okay, well, so it's time then for me to um, to, to wrap up. Um, of course, I need to thank both Trevor and B for their fascinating talk this evening. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been really interesting, a really great insight into the huge variety of work that goes on on these uh, on these conservation breaks. So thank you both. Uh, also need to thank Dave Richards, uh, who's, uh, who's hiding in the background and has hosted the Zoom session. Uh, next Tuesday, we're doing something completely different. Uh, Paul Connolly, who, uh, whose name uh, I mentioned earlier on when Paul submitted a question. Uh, Paul is going to be joining me to talk about how Lundy has inspired him to write poetry about the island. Uh, Paul's going to recite some of his own work, including a specially written poem for the lockdown. We've also launched a Lundy Limerick competition. Uh, so we're asking for your witty and entertaining contributions. Um, the details I put up on Facebook a few days ago, uh, and I'm gonna share further information by email in the next day or two. Uh, Paul, Dave and I will be judging your entries uh, and there will be a mystery prize courtesy of Sue Waterfield in the Lundy General Stores. Uh, so, so completely different format next week, we're gonna have a poetry recital, Paul will take some questions, uh, and then we're going to judge uh, the Limerick competition. I've already had eight entries when I last booked, so uh, please, please do submit uh, your Limericks. Uh, there's, there's already some really, really entertaining things there, so really looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a really fun evening next week. So other than that, uh, of course, uh, if you're joining us on Zoom, as ever every week, uh, when, you, when this Zoom session ends, you receive a link to a feedback survey. Uh, I'm always grateful if you can fill it in and uh, submit your answers, because it really helps me planning and adjusting the format of, the, uh, of these talks and fine tuning bits of detail. 
So other than that, it's time to say goodbyes. Trevor, would you like to say your goodbyes? Yes, Michael, thank you very much for allowing us to talk about working parties. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it. And I know the amount of work you and Dave do behind the scenes deserves a lot of thanks and what you do for the LFS as well. But so thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thanks very much, Trevor. Thanks for those words. And, and B, do you want to say goodbye? Yes. Thank you for watching everybody and what he said. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And, and that's it. Um, thank you, everybody who's been watching, for joining us this evening. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.